Thank you for attending the fireside session. I understand we're the only thing standing between you and a drink today. So, it, this is going to be a chat on the era of extreme ability, focusing on the FinFET that uh, primarily that Global Foundries has just announced this last week. I'm pleased with me to have with me today. I've got uh, John Heinlein, the VP of Marketing at Arm. I also have. Uh, Srinivas Nori, the Director of SOC Innovation from Global Foundries. Sumermani Kanjiri, VP of Technology Architecture at Global Foundries. And then Bruce Kleinman, the VP of Mark Product Marketing at Global Foundries. So as the industry started to move into the era of extreme mobility, you know, the key to success is a transistor. And we're seeing a great transition take place the transistors involved evolve from the search for performance not being very critical, where we cranked up the power and just let the transistor you know, move up into the gigahertz range. And now we're more concerned about the power performance equation. And for many of you in the audience, that's a critical part as your decision making as to what device you're going to put in that appliance that we're going to stick up to our air or use as a tablet or use as our mobile PC. The transistor itself has evolved over the last several years, and you'll tell how long I've been in the industry by some of my comments, is the fact that we've gone from a bird's beak with a polysilicon gate with aluminum to now to the point that we've got hafnium oxides, metal gates, copper, and 3D architecture. The new FinFET transistors are being used to drive the mobile world with greater connectivity and speed with each ensuing generation of mobile devices. Mobile PCs, tablets, and smartphones are expected to account for the majority of semiconductor revenue growth over the next five years. This afternoon, we're going to have a panel discussion on the era of extreme mobility, focused on the first foundry 14 nanometer FinFET announced by Global Foundries, the 14XM. Each of the participants will have some opening comments and we'll get us some questions that are provided by the audience in advance that we took from uh, some earlier emails that you sent in. With that, let's get started, and we'll have John give us his version of what we see with the 14 nanometer. Yeah, thanks, Dean. I think uh, just to give you some introduction uh, about me and about your uh, perspective on this, uh, I'm Vice President Marketing from the Physical IP Division of ARM, which is the, the division that really touches the transistors, if you will, and tries to deliver silicon implementation solutions. Uh, today I'll be representing really that division as well as ARM overall. Uh, the, our general thinking here is that we're trying to educate uh, everyone that implementation matters. Uh, and more and more importantly, you have to align the processor implementation with the process technology and so on. Uh, the background, of course, of that uh, comment is the scaling challenges we're facing today. 28 nanometer is uh, you know, ramping very well now. I think it'll be a very successful and long-lived node. 20 nanometer is in front of us with a lot of technology challenges, double pattern and so on. Uh, and after 20, uh, and even to some extent at 20, uh, there's a lot of scaling challenges. So the question is how do we continue into the future? Uh, as we're seeing that with uh, the challenges, Moore's Law is starting to stall out. We need a way to continue the scaling to enjoy the gains and we've seen in the future. Uh, also, the background is uh, today's uh, wonderful announcement of our A50, Cortex A50 series processors, which are now going to take the ARM uh, processor architecture into a much broader set of uh, markets. And so we need to make sure we have a diverse implementation solution that's going to service that broad set of markets well into the future. So that's our perspective and a little bit of a setup. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to attend the uh, panel here. Uh, my name is Srinivas Nori, as uh, Dean introduced. I look after the SOC solutions, primarily dealing with uh, ARM uh, ecosystem strategy and other SOC related uh, innovation uh, that we can bring to bear. Um, the reason we call this uh, FinFlexion point, I, I will touch upon a little bit um, and we'll build up on that through the panel session. Uh, if, if you look at the history of the computer, um, you know, I, mean, my, I started my career. Uh, couple decades ago, uh, like Dean was saying, you know, using uh, Amdog mainframe computers at the time, the eight processor mainframe was occupying uh, space that was larger than this deck here. 
um, if you include the you know, memory subsystem and all that. Uh, but the MIPS were probably around 120 <coughs> IBM MIPS. And if you take the 386 at the time, 10 MIPS maybe. And uh, now fast forward to uh, Cortex A9, dual core. It's uh, on the order of uh, 7,500 MIPS for one and a half gigahertz. And uh, A15, 30, 37, 35,000 uh, MIPS, which is orders of magnitude more. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's a heavy demand in terms of the performance and the features. Um, Professor Kumi had a paper in the Annals of uh, Computing History where, you know, he was showing that every one and a half years, the efficiency, the electrical efficiency of the computing has been doubling. Um, so, if you were to take, let's say, a MacBook Air today and uh, run it at the same efficiency as uh, 1991, uh, you know, system, power system, then you probably get two and a half seconds of uh, battery life, which obviously, you know, it's not going to work, right? So, there are heavy demands in terms of the performance, heavy demands in terms of the power, and we need to be keeping pace with both of them. And then on top of that, you know, nowadays, you have all this computing power in the palm of your hand. If you look at uh, any of these uh, smartphones today, you know, there's multi-processor cores in there, thinner, uh, you know, form factors, higher resolution screens, higher data rates, everything higher. And you all need to do that at a very, very low uh, power uh, battery life. The, but the challenge is the battery life is not keeping pace uh, along with the technology. So, uh, now, as we all know, uh, up until the 40 nanometer FinFET, the VDD scaling has been slowing down. And also the leakage is not being controlled as well as the geometry shrink. So uh, that's the reason why we call this a fifth flexion point because it's the first time where we are able to actually scale the VDD further down. And we are also able to control the leakage much better. Uh, and that enables us to take the integration to the next level. All right, great. Subi. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Subi Kangiri. I'm, uh, I'm a rep responsible for advanced technology architecture within the office of the CTO. Just uh, talking a little bit more about what uh, Srinivas and, and John were already talking, we realized that in you know, approximately about two to two and a half years back, one of the interesting things that was happening in the industry was really the following which is, you know, typically the CPUs were driving the leading edge technology, and therefore when really talking about the definition of the technology, it was kind of, you know, easy. Go get whatever gigahertz you can at any cost, and, you know, typically that's the way that was all operating. But for all the reasons that you just heard from the other panelists, the, the battery life and, and uh, energy, uh, oops, watch out, energy efficiency was, was very critical. But, what we also have seen in the last about two and a half to three years is the mobile SOCs are, are becoming really important to the extent that it's actually starting to drive the definition of the leading edge technology. And that's new. And, and when mobile SOCs start to drive the leading edge technology, the, the definition of the technology you know, takes a different tone. Right, it's not just performance at any cost. Now you're talking about power, you're talking about footprint, you're talking about cost. You, all of that has to be very, very well optimized, rather carefully optimized. And so what we did is about two and a half years back, we created a dedicated function within uh, within Global Foundries, and that's the that's what we call as advanced technology architecture to really focus on on making sure that we're getting all the right technology uh, definition so that we don't have to go back and redo anything extreme, but at the same time we're looking at technology to, to all the way to applications. So the team is really the front end, to the back end, to litho, to memory architecture, to device integration. All the experts in one group self-contained to work with key customers, work with you know, the ecosystem, and to make sure that all of those requirements are rolled in into the technology development or technology platform up front. So that's the technology architecture uh, function. All right. Bruce, why don't you let us hear it from a product perspective? Well, before I do that, Dean, I have to hand it to you. So I've been on a number of these panels, and you know, as moderator, Dean gets to pick the order that we're sitting in. And I was wondering what got me stuck on the end here. And uh, you know, I went through all the different algorithms I've seen in the past alphabetically, and that was it. 
uh, height, and that wasn't it. But you, you've actually chosen best dressed to least. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen that algorithm. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I'm actually relatively new to uh, Global Foundries. I've been with the company just a few months. And uh, let me share with you the perspective that uh, really struck me as a new employee of Global Foundries. Subi can uh, attest to this because he was there when I went, holy come on. Um, uh, Global Foundry started off with uh, an exceptionally strong position at uh, 28 nanometer with high K metal gate. And uh, the company has shipped over half a million high K metal gate wafers to date. Uh, from there, the company started work on the 20 nanometer process. And this is really the unique element. At the same time they started work on the 20 nanometer process, which is planar, they had the 14 nanometer FinFET process right in the crosshairs. And so the decisions that were made as uh, the 20 nanometer process was defined, those decisions were made very much with 14 nanometer FinFET in mind. And the result, the result that you're seeing us bring to market now, is a product that will be more complete, more mature, the, the first day out the gate with IP from our partners, with libraries, with the tools, with the PDKs that you normally associate with a much longer time frame. So I think what you're going to find when uh, you take a look at our 14 nanometer XM product is not just outstanding technology, but a full product that's ready for our customers to begin designing. All right, great. Thank you. All right, so we'll start off with a few questions that the audience has provided. And, you know, John, since you're sitting closest, we're going to start off with you. And so what does the FinFET mean for the design community? And what changes does this bring to the table from a transistor development perspective, both immediately and then further into the future for ARM and some of the devices that you've you know, announced this morning? Sure. If, you, uh, if you've seen any of our recent presentations, and uh, if you haven't, I encourage you to come back on Thursday. Uh, a little shameless plug, we're doing another panel on Thursday morning where we'll talk a little bit about some of this stuff, stuff as well. We've, uh, we've got a, a little video we've been showing that talks about some of the, the challenges you face. And if you look at planar CMOS, uh, it's incredible, incredible what's been accomplished in, in that. But at the same time, all the tricks have been pulled out of the bag. You know, high key metal gate, that these guys have shipped a lot of high key metal gate wafers very effectively and it's really helpful. Strain silicon is very helpful. Physical scaling is very helpful. But when, you know, all of that is reaching its limits. And so what we're looking to do is kind of uh, turn the corner, and that's why the, 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 the pun about inflection point is kind of interesting, because you really do need to turn the corner and do something different. So what we look to FinFET to do is to help us return to the kind of scaling that will help us into uh, 16, 14, and in the future uh, generations, um, you, know, to, you know, even to, into the, uh, the following generations after that. We think FinFET obviously offers at the high level higher performance capabilities, higher, higher on currents, but also high, a better ion versus eye off trade off. So you get better dry when it's on, and you get better off when it's off. And isn't that nice? Um, we also think that this is going to help take us to, as I mentioned earlier, some of these high performance markets. Today, uh, you tend to have uh, very disparate, perform dif disparate processes for high performance versus low power. And I think this kind of technology offers the promise to allow us to satisfy a broader set of markets uh, with, with one technology. You know, as you said, what's uh, near and, and into the future? I mean, today, as you said, the key driver is uh, mobile applications, you know, which range from phones, of course, to tablets and so on. We're starting to see with the announcement of Chromebook here uh, earlier this week, uh, the uh, last week, the, uh, the emergence of mobile type uh, platforms as well based on ARM, which is extremely exciting. Into the future, you heard this morning with the announcement of A50, a lot more discussion about low power servers and scaling the ARM architecture into new places. So I think this whole FinFET background is perfect to enable that broader part of us. Great, thank you. So Srinivas, as the transistor continues to shrink, the performance, power, the performance to power consumption becomes a gating factor for most mobile devices. You know, you talked about the battery consumption. How does the FinFET transistor impact this transition? And how will this impact not only the SOC, but also the other devices that are critical in the power performance equation, such as analog and RF? It's a good question. Um, so, you know, like I was saying earlier, basically, 
the three fet, the value that it brings is that you know, it enables one to lower the VDD at a better scaling than what we have seen so far. You know, we are able to get to much lower VDDs, um, uh, you know, like Subi was referring to earlier, right? Um, and that in itself is a big value proposition because active power then, you know, is a square function, so it kind of uh, goes up uh, significantly uh, in terms of power savings right there. And then, because of the, the short channel effects uh, being uh, under better control, because of the an improved gate for the 3D infrastructure, the leakage is much better controlled, right? So because of that, there is obviously the standby, standby uh, battery life also increases significantly. So those two obviously help the SOC designers when they're especially designing for mobile applications. Um, nowadays, of course, power is important in all the applications. Uh, but then if you move on, uh, like I don't know how many of you attended uh, you know, Gary's uh, talk this morning with the IBM on the uh, FinFET, but uh, one of the things is the variation of the uh, you know, VT especially is much better controlled. Um, and one of the things that designers hate uh, with their closing design is the variation because they have to pack it so much uh, margins. Uh, you know, as people know this by what's called OCV, and you know, it's artificially, uh, you know, you gotta go put in the margin because you wanna play it safe, to improve yields and all that. So now, you know, you have one less factor that's influencing the OCV. And so, uh, one less thing to worry about in terms of design closure, one less thing to worry about in terms of area overhead because of, uh, you know, whole time fixes that you have to do, you know, the area that increases when you're actually doing uh, higher performance with the variation in there, all kinds of uh, side effects can be minimized. And then uh, moving on uh, from that, you know, if you look at, I, I also uh, learned, you know, from the technology team that the uh, sensitivity to temperature inversion effect is also uh, reduced. Uh, that's also a welcome change. We started seeing that, I think, back when we did the 65 nanometer, 90 nanometer, which was a surprise, uh, uh, unwelcome surprise. So again, that's the inflection point where we're starting to see that recede, uh, which is a good change. Um, so I think there are several factors that you know that would help the SOC designer. The other thing is uh, our technology team has done a phenomenal job in terms of uh, you know if you take the fiddle pitch and the metal pitch, they have talked through the whole uh, you know design cycle, not just at the technology level, right? To see you know what is the optimal fiddle pitch, what's the optimal metal pitch, so that I could get an optimal um, if you will an eight track metal um, um, A-track library or standard source wise. So uh, I'm told that you know, based on the feedback we got from the IP providers, we are, we are probably the only foundry who can enable an A-track uh, library today uh, without sacrificing the uh, performance while still getting the density. So now if you take that, um, the way it would help the associate designer would be, um, you know, today's associates, like I was saying, they have the, of course, multi-core processors, they have the graphics cores, they have the video multimedia engines in there. Then they have a modem, lots of peripherals, truly a large SOC. Now, not everything needs to run at super speed. Some of them can be run at lower speed. Um, so those components can take advantage of the denser A-track library, which is a result of the FinFET in our case. Um, you know, so I would say, uh, for instance, another example is ARM is pushing uh, heavily the big little concept nowadays, rightfully so, right? And again, the idea there is the big is taking the heavy weight of uh, workload, the little is really for the low power applications. So the little component can be, uh, you know, uh, realistically it can be implemented using an A-Track library. Um, I mean, I have seen some performance numbers from some of the uh, semiconductor vendors uh, that have done the big little, where the little one is running probably five megahertz which is not really that fast. So that's an example where we can benefit. Uh, you know, the other thing I would say is from the analog, I think you're asking, you know, how does it benefit the analog designers? Uh, you know, our, again, our team has done a great job in terms of, uh, if you take the, all the active components are finified, but even the passive components are finified. You know, everything, the diodes, the cap capacitors, resistors, everything is finified, transistor-like. And, uh, you know, because of the lower VT, it is much better headroom. And so what happens is uh, the transconductance is higher, and uh, you would also see that because of the reduced VT variation, you know the 
analog designers do lots of Monte Carlo simulations and they hate the variation again, and that again is minimized there. So that definitely helps them. Uh, so there are significant advantages for everybody, both digital and analog. It just, just to add to that uh, analog part, right, if you look at the, the trend, right, going 1965, 48, 28, all on planar, the, the analog characteristics were really uh, getting degraded, right, if you look at the game, for example. But this is the first time that we have, uh, going from planar to FinFET, for all the reasons that uh, she was just mentioning, that the trend is actually reversed. So we can actually have analog characteristics as good as, let's say, a 65 nanometer uh, class analog characteristic, which is which is outstanding. So give that to the hands of uh, you know, all the creative designers. There's going to be a lot more innovations uh, coming on that. Yeah, as one of my uh, friends who is a Surtees designer said, uh, when uh, he took a look at our FinFET technology, finally I get my transistor yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> so this we we may we may uh, excuse me we may really see some of those advances in analog that we've sort of been waiting for yep. Yep. as they've been very creative with their designs, but because of the device architecture, it's been difficult to A, shrink, and B, create the types of devices we've been looking for with respect to power control and things along those lines. Yep. Oh, great. So Bruce, as we see global foundry transition to the new technology, what risks do you foresee and how do your customers reduce that risk in such a rapid transition from you know, 28 to 20 to 14? And then, you know, a little bit of your nomenclature, why are we calling the 14 nan XM a 14 nanometer process? Well, that's quite a question. Let's see. <laughs> Remember all of that. Um, so first of all, uh, we have, as I mentioned uh, at, at the outset, we have a, an enormous amount of experience with high K metal gate on 28 nanometer. So for global, the transition, global and our customers, the transition from 28 nanometer to 20 nanometer um, is building on an enormous amount of success with high K metal gate on 28. So that's a very, very clean path. Now, as uh, Subi can probably explain it, it more accurately than I can, but let me give this a shot. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there were decisions that were made on the 20 nanometer process with an eye toward 14XN. And so customers can begin designing today with our 20 LPM planar uh, process um, and follow a set of what we call FIN-friendly design rules, um, which, which are uh, uh, a slight addition to the normal design rules that they would follow for just a purely 20 nanometer uh, planar design. And if they follow those rules, they'll be able to take that design from 20 nanometer planar to 14 nanometer thin fet with maybe 25% redesign, something on that order. So very, very modest amount of redesign. And so from a risk standpoint, customers can move to 20 nanometer with the total confidence of a foundry that has tremendous success with high K metal gate. And then looking forward at thin fet, they can begin their design on 20 nanometer uh, planar and then decide based on their schedule, based on the requirements, based on what their market window looks like, whether or not they want to go to market with 20 nanometer planar or in midstream switch to 14 nanometer FinFET. And I, I think that's a very low risk path for our customers to follow. They don't have to bet the farm on uh, FinFET from the, uh, from the beginning. Okay. So, so touching upon that, um, the two things, right? One Did I get talk? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. So we're talking about uh, risk mitigation, number one, and then we also the other question of why do we call this 40 nanometer class, right? I, th I think it's important to understand that. First, let me talk about the 40 nanometer class. If we really look at uh, what we did is, you know, 28 nanometer, and then we, you know, the industry went to 20 nanometer, and we were all looking at uh, what is next, and we all moved from planar to FinFET, the whole industry did. But then we were also looking at uh, a few other things, right? If you look at the industry, the first one to come up with the FinFET, we all know who that is. And uh, typically, the back end pitch was, was always a, you know, a generation behind the foundries, right? You, you know, if you look at the top IDM that, that released the 
pitch at first, and, and if you compare the back end pitch, that's always the case, right? Foundries were always handicapped un unnecessarily, even though we were we were better on the back end pitch. So, for example, 90 nanometer uh, pitch on the on the 28 nanometer or 32 nanometer class, and then we went to you know 64 nanometer or the 20 nanometer, whereas you know the, the industry leader was really at uh, 90 nanometer even on the 22. So we were looking at this, and the second part is when you look at the for example, um, if you have attended some of those sessions this morning, uh, and also the thing that Srinivas was talking about, the fin pitch is a critical aspect, right? If, because going from planar uh, to fin fat, you do get the device performance improvement, but the next bigger performance improvement at the SOC level really comes with the fin pitch, the number of fins that you have, you know, in a, in a given area. And um, our fin pitch, and we have publicly stated this, is really 48 nanometer, which is which is already a generation ahead of the first generation FinFed that, that was announced in the industry last year. So taking it account all of this, we said it's really a 14 nanometer class device and performance, and that is even before the marketing guys really you know, call it 14, we really knew from, from a technical point of view it was really 14. So that was the main reason why we really called it a 14 nanometer class. And then further, if you go into the Fin device itself, we really optimized the the height of the fin and the width of the fin and the rest of the uh, architecture to be really, truly a 40 nanometer class. The, the other part was the risk mitigation. I want to just touch upon that a little bit. Uh, Bruce already did a great job talking about it. There are two parts to that, right? The way we see it is there's a technology enablement piece and then there's a customer enablement piece. Both have to be taken care of. If we just have the you know technology and, and it's not fully enabled, obviously we can't get into high volume manufacturing with real products in the, in the hands of our customers. So we've got to look at both. So from a technology enablement point of view, what we did is high chem metal gate. We all knew the whole industry went through the whole uh, problem the, through the learning curve. It was not unique to anybody. Everybody had to go through the learning curve. We did not want to go take the same approach this time. We said. All the investments that we have made in our R&D on the 20 planar, three, three and a half years, we wanted to leverage every bit of that to the extent possible. And, and the best possible is go all the way down to the middle of line, leverage everything there, and replace the front end device from planar to FinFed. And what this really did is it helped us build the test chips, help learning, you know, get to, get to the focus on fin module learning and, and leave everything else le fully leveraged from, from pretty Plano. That mitigated the technology bring up risk. And we were able to get our first test chips up and running and we could just focus on fin module. There are about 7,000 rules that, that were all carried over from uh, 20 Plano to, to FinFed and, and the few odd rules that are uh, unique to fin, that was the only focus. So the whole technology bring up risk was mitigated. From a design point of view, it's very similar. In fact, the PDKs, the very early PDKs, like, like Bruce was talking about, could have almost been uh, the same as 20 LPM. So for the first time, and this has really never happened in the past, right? Today, our customers and IP vendors and, and the whole ecosystem can actually start working on the, on the FinFed class uh, enablement purely based on everything that was already there, which is, which is a 20 planar. So, so a concurrent enablement was possible, so the design starts could, could really happen much sooner than any time in the past. And, and, the, and the net result, and a real proof point really is that we know we are all on track uh, to actually have you know, product tape outs in 2013. So that's, that's incredible. Yeah, and th 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 this I just want to touch on very briefly. There there's another element of risk that we don't normally think about. We think about technology risk, and we think about yield risk, and we think about all those things. But uh, often we don't think about the risk of, is your product going to be competitive and successful in the marketplace? And what we've done by taking this approach, uh, this modular approach with 14XM, is we've compressed our normal time frame from two years between each node to one year from 20 LPM to 14 exit. And that's gonna enable all of you to bring superior products to market one year sooner than you would have been able to otherwise.
Now, so it sounds like, you know, when you started the whole 20 nanometer program, you had in mind that, okay, we've got to transition to this 14 nanometer, and it's going to be a fin, and so we need to have this in our minds as we're going forward, and your design rules already at, at 20 nanometer fit what you're doing with this modular approach. Is that wrap it up? Exactly. All right. All right. That's right, and that extends to the IP ecosystem as well. Okay. That is that you know, from, the, from the very beginning, uh, our engagement on 20 and 14 contemplated both uh, literally simultaneously. So it wasn't a you know, 20 and then come back later to 14, it was a how do we solve both problems in one case. Okay. Well, John, then that kind of leads into the next question for you is, you know, what role does the design ecosystem play in enabling the success at Leading Edge? You know, as we make these rapid transitions, and what are some of the challenges ARM has seen in bringing up the ThinFet design ecosystem? So I'll talk a little bit on behalf of the physical IP side. You know, the processor team in general uh, is focusing very intently now on being design aware. As I said, you know, implementation matters. Uh, and on the physical IP side, we're the place where the rubber meets the road. Uh, so. Our goal is, in a sense, to accelerate time to market and drive time to market at these advanced cores and get the diversity of the ARM partnerships uh, applications into the market as fast as possible. Now, the contrast, though, is that despite all the wonderful uh, talking points that we've been mentioning, and that's all true, there is also significant complexity that comes with every new technology node. So I've got a few data points to share with you. For the purposes of um, shifting the FinFET away from planar technology, there's uh, three, just three examples of you. First is design rule complexity. The design rule complexity does go up. Uh, there's a lot more uh, restrictions on uh, design rules, a lot more restricted patterns to keep in the field and so on. And that's a real challenge. Uh, we've seen that our, you know, from a human effort, the uh, layout is much more difficult. So we've invested in layout automation. We, uh, last year we acquired Prolific, which is the world leader in layout automation, to try to attack the growing complexity of the layout side. Similarly, double patterning. The double patterning comes up at 20, so we sort of get the, the, first, the first taste of it. But actually it gets worse because we see up to three times the extraction corners due to the alignment issues associated with double patterning. And that's going to continue to get worse. Uh, finally, when it comes to uh, extraction and simulation, we see up to five times more complexity in extraction and simulation in FinFET compared to previous nodes. So you say, well, that all sounds pretty bad. But what the IP ecosystem does, and what ARM on the physical IP side is trying to do, is take that complexity and solve it and hide it from the end user so that we get that out of the way as a delay. What we're trying to do is solve these problems, they're legitimate problems, work with the foundries, work with the EDA providers, and solve these problems in advance so that by the time uh, designers come and start designing with it, we've addressed a lot of these complexity issues. Uh, and uh, we really try to hide that and bundle and package it away. Okay. Now, Bruce mentioned this in his conversation that, you know, he said, you know, they're going from that 20 to 14 nanometer, it's only about a 25% redesign. So, if I'm a customer coming in and I've designed my 20 nanometer with Global Foundries and ARM, and then I want to go to 14, how much can I repurpose and how much do I have to recreate in order to get my product? Because that's a very rapid transition. Sure, it depends uh, at which level you're talking about. I mean, that when it, with respect to uh, complex IP blocks and so on, there's going to really be customization on a per process basis. Uh, on the digital side, what we're trying to do is contemplate a library set and a memory compiler set and so on that's very coherent between the two. So, from a logical level, you can reuse. Uh, in many cases, there may be footprint compatibility. In other cases, there may be you know a footprint friendly migration forward. But we're trying to anticipate. And to some extent, we did this within the 32 and 28 nanometer generation with global factors previously. By by looking forward to 28, and when we did 32, the 32 results um, you know was forward looking, and it gave us a, a faster path forward. And we're doing that even even more so here. Okay, great. Thank you. So while you jump in, Subi, I'm going to add a little bit more of the question to pull Bruce into this. And so, you know, we've got the collaborative effort between ARM and Global Foundries, and so does that, how does that help you two in your role, since it's a little bit different than what these two gentlemen are doing? And then you also have another larger collaborative effort with the Common Platform yep. Alliance. And so how does that, you know, play into the role of the development of this? And that collaboration work to roll out this FinFET technology. Yeah, that, that's very important, especially with the complexity of the Fin architecture and bringing up, you know, Fin in high volume production is not easy for anybody. So, so really, the way we look at collaboration is, you know, three levels, right? One is at the joint 
they don't develop an alliance that, that we have with IBM, Samsung, and Microsoft people. We're really bringing the best global talent in the world to really make that happen, right? We've had decades of uh, FinFET research that we're leveraging and building on it. So that's one level of collaboration, which is basically the technology level. The second one is what Shimon's and John were just talking about, which is the IP ecosystem, and, and they've already covered that, so I won't uh, talk much about that. But there's also another layer, which is, um, the, of course, the EDA system, because the EDA ecosystem is also very critical at this point, when we especially move from, uh, you know, the, the getting into double patterning was, was not easy, right? You know, how do we do the colorless or you know, double patterning, what, what happens to the extractions, the accuracies of that, all that had to be taken care of up front. So that's the, all of the EDA ecosystem collaboration. But uh, last but not the least is the customer collaboration as well. And especially in this particular case, for about two years, we worked very, very closely with you know key customers who are actually leaders in the mobile market space and uh, making sure that all of those requirements are embedded in our technology architecture. Because going from planar to FinFET gives you all those options. Suddenly you have so many degree of freedom, but you gotta be able to manage that carefully and extract the full value of FinFET for the, for the right application. And so we work very, very closely with, with key customers and, and make sure that our technology architecture is, is in the sweet spot that, that it can go from a wireless OC all the way up to the networking and servers. Okay. Bruce, anything to add That's to that? A smooth, uh, a smooth segue for me. So you've probably heard the term virtual IDM. Uh, we prefer the term collaborative device manufacturing. And uh, really what you'll see in working with global foundries is uh, a personality of collaboration, a personality of partnership. Um, we work very, very closely with our customers, not just in defining the products themselves, but in making sure that the customers are successful in implementing the product all the way through to, uh, to volume production. So um, I think you'll find in working with Global Foundries a uh, much higher degree of transparency, a much uh, stronger spirit of uh, partnership than you'll find with, uh, with other foundries. So the collaboration certainly begin, begins at the technology level, but I just want to emphasize that our company from our CEO all the way throughout the uh, 13,000 employees of Global Foundries really believes quite strongly in the collaboration, the partnership, the mutual success. And uh, we believe that at 14XM, uh, with this process, uh, we, Global Foundries, our partners, and our customers will all enjoy tremendous success. All right, great, great. So basically, it's a very important part of the entire process, you know, exactly. from the initial design all the way to the finished product with your clients and customers in order for them to be successful, because that just kind of rolls all the way uphill to, to ARM, as well as Global Foundries. All right. So, um, you know, as we look at this, and I'm going to address this at John and Bruce to start, and what in product value can mobile customers expect with the FinFET powered ARM processor? Sure, I think, uh, as the FinFET processor is going to let us get back to the kind of scaling we've enjoyed. As, a, as you look forward to the kinds of more and more complex devices that you saw a little preview this morning with the A50 series, but the same goes uh, for mobile as well, you're seeing a broader and more complex set of configurations, you know, especially when you look at the uh, little, uh, there's lots of different uh, trade-offs you can make. And so what we're trying to do is really drive time to market acceleration. So one key product value uh, we want to not let go of is a time. Because um, being competitive in time is critical in this uh, competitive uh, marketplace. Uh, one of the things that we're you know, talking about now is our pop product line. By being so intimately involved you know, with the process and processor together, is we're able to launch our pop IP coincident with the release of our cores. So that day one, when the cores come out for widespread availability, we'll have pop uh, IP packages for the relevant leading processes that are, uh, that are key for, for customers. And that's going to bring you know, the benefits we talked about earlier, lower premium, superior power performance, kind of balanced trade-offs, and better leakage control. So the, the combination, we think, is when you combine big-little, which is compelling at our architecture level, 
with uh, good implementation awareness via the top of bound physical IP combined with the FinFET process like 14 XM, we think the combination of those three things is going to be hand down the most competitive solution, the most compelling solution in the industry for mobile devices at So you've, you've hit on all the, the uh, big points. Let me put some numbers behind that just to give a little bit of a flavor. So uh, comparing our 20 nanometer planar process with our 14 nanometer FinTech process, uh, first let's think in terms of um, constant performance, equivalent performance. Uh, 14XM uh, lowers the power consumption by 40 to 60 percent. So pr pretty dramatic power consumption reduction. Alternatively, if all you were after was performance, and so you locked in at constant power consumption, you'll see between a 20 percent and a 55 percent increase in <coughs> system level performance. And uh, that's quite a wide range. It depends on uh, the voltage that you're operating at. But I'm happy to say that the, the high end of that range, the 55%, is at the lower voltages prevalent in mobile designs. So in other words, you'll see the greatest performance improvement um, in the lower voltages at uh, uh, a mobile SOC design. Um, but as Subi will probably chime in and, and help me along here, we actually provide the ability for our customers to select any point within that entire design space. Um, not just for the device as a whole, but actually for subsystems within the device. So you can operate a certain subsystem for the lowest possible power, where performance isn't uh, important. You might have a graphics element where performance is king. Um, and you optimize that for the highest level of performance. All within the same process technology, uh, uh, not two different processes on one die, but one process technology that our customers can select where they want to operate within their SOC to optimize each of the subsystems within the design. And we mentioned it quickly as well. I mean, we talked about POP, and, and it's very easy to get, uh, to get confused that POP is only about top and megahertz. But in fact, actually, we're seeing more and more draw from our customers to satisfy a range of implementation points. So I think you guys mentioned with Big Little, they want to very well target the implementation of the Big Core and the Little Core in very different places. But it also goes for graphics. And just to, just to reiterate, with 14XM, one of the things that uh, Global Foundries uh, invested in is uh, linking with ARM on the uh, optimization of next generation mobile graphics as well. Because graphics is, if you've ever seen uh, some of these recent die plots, a growing silicon area consumer a growing power consumer. So by targeting the graphics, which often has very different trade-offs because graphics fundamentally gets performance from parallelism as opposed to one megahertz. And so if you can target a better power performance trade-off by uh, using the right trade-offs for that, you can actually get a much better system trade-off than just trying to cram a square peg into a round hole. Yeah, so John, that's, that's very important. We know what we understand from all the discussions that we have had, that you need to with your process roadmap and all that, in the next generation processors, embedded graphics is going to be very critical. You know, 30, 40 percent of the area can be occupied by uh, embedded graphic too. So our technology architecture only takes care of that and we can talk more detail outside if, if anybody is more interested. But, but going back to what Bruce was talking about, this is really the first time that we have this ability to really operate at a wide range of, you know, voltage, right? Uh, let's say about 400 millivolt of operating range was never possible in the past for many reasons. Of course, it, it's not all free. You know, it may, be, it may look very interesting from a, from a design point of view, but from a technology point of view, to really make that happen, we had to account for a lot of other things. And one of them was, for example, the reliability. Especially when you have such a wide voltage range, the, the voltage acceleration impacting your TDDV is, is not easy. However, when you look at it from an SOC application and put this voltage range together, and look at some of the power management schemes, uh, voltage domains to multiple rails or uh, uh, any anything else, power gatings to all of that. All that is now possible, plus you have a wide operating voltage uh, range. And, and give all this in the hands of, like I said earlier, you know, the creative designers. We truly believe there can be a number of uh, interesting innovations that can come out of this. All right, thank you. So, should have asked, we've left you quiet for a little while. Yeah, catch your breath, <laughs> allowing you to catch your breath here. Um, 
And so we're going to we're going to sort of go back to the network SOC and embedded processors, additional devices, and what type of role you know we focused a lot on mobility, the power performance picture. But what role do you see that playing in the network processors or the embedded processors and network SOCs? That's a good uh, segue from what Sugi was just mentioning. Right, I think because we have uh, such a large uh, you know, variability in the VDD, you know, almost 300 uh, uh, millivolts to 4 millivolts, right? I think one could trade off the performance to the power, right? So that's the reason why, you know, using the same technology node, one could implement, you know, very low power mobility applications as well as very high performance centric uh, networking associates using the same technology. Because, you know, you could, you could, you could actually just trade off the VDD versus the uh, uh, power. Um, you know, if you look at the typical network SOCs today, there's the control plane, and then there's the data plane operations. You know, and if you look at a packet processing engine, you know, there's lots of high performance need in there, there's a lot of memory bandwidth requirements, DDR3, 4, 5 type, and then of course, uh, needless to say, the 30s, 10 gig plus, and so on. So, um, all these uh, can be uh, realized in the following example. Um, you know, we do have high performance networking uh, customers today at our 40 nanometer. And we do know, like Bruce was saying, the 49 nanometer uh, gives us about uh, at least 30 to 40 percent performance improvement compared to the 20 nanometer. So uh, there's no problem in terms of being able to realize that. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, even compared to 20 nanometer, you know, we would get about 30 percent headroom in terms of performance. And finally, um, you know, as we all, I think nobody talked about this, but people are looking into 3D IC technologies, right? Now, as you go into FinFEDs, power is getting lower, both active and static. Lower power makes the solution for the 3D stacking that much more easier to implement. Uh, today, as we all know, people are talking about it, but people are doing 2.5D silicon interposer based, purely because of the economics. I think FinFED will be on the inflection point in that direction as well. Well, that'd be great. I know we've been talking about 3D ICs for many years and getting there, and that would be nice if we found us up without realizing. By the way, Dean, I just have to insert a little bit of a teaser here. So uh, earlier this fall, when we announced 14XM, uh, um, we talked mostly about mobility, and we touched on compute as well, and we touched on networking. Um, stay tuned. Uh, in the not too distant future, we'll be revisiting the high performance and and what our uh, FinFET technology can deliver at the high performance. Yeah. Great. And so we've got one last question and just about two and a half minutes left, so you're going to have to be succinct on this one. You may not be able to with the, what it is. You know, at 32 and 28 industry wide, uh, we had a lot of issues with yields early on in the ramp, both due to die size, due to the complexity of the high K metal gate structure that we were looking at. What can be done at the 20 to 14 nanometer ramp to mitigate some of the yield issues and thus alleviate some of, alleviate some of the supply issues we saw at 28 nanometer, but also how to make your customers more comfortable that it's going to be a profitable ramp, especially since they're having to make that very quick transition from 20 to 14. That's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually all of you. I think all okay, of you. Okay, all of you. I'll comment on that. Brief on this. Definitely going from planar to FinFET is not easy. Okay, I mean, there's a number of challenges and high chemical metal gate, like I already said, we, we all went through a learning curve. And, and FinFET is built on high chemical metal gate learning, right? So we got first cross that chasm and then, then go to FinFET. So we have crossed the high chemical metal gate chasm. We are now getting all the FinFET module, or FIN module. So for for exactly that reason, being the, this being the first generation FinFET, we want to be extremely careful and um, to make sure that we are leveraging everything that's, that we already know. And, and that's the whole idea. The 7,000 ground rules, no change for the last three years. Everything that was learned is being carried over. There are about 16 FIN rules, and, and that's the whole focus. So we are minimizing our changes. We, won't, we don't want any new uh, variables or issues to be introduced in FIN because it already has FIN height control to DFIN control to many of the other things that we have to focus on and we are pulling in the schedule. We want to just stay focused on the FIN module and that's how we're going to make sure that if you look at our D0 learning uh, plan compared to the, the 20 Plano, 
it's it's really very very close because we're already leveraging everything from the middle of line all the way down. Great, thank you, Sidney. Any comments from? I, I see it scooting forward there, Bruce. Anything? Yeah. So I, I own our uh, uh, shuttle program, so I have to insert a, a comment about that. We have, we have a dynamite shuttle program, and we're going to be launching 14 nanometer shuttles uh, very, very early. You know, to, to, to it, I think if you look back to our history uh, from an ecosystem and IP side, uh, we have a history of 32 and 28 having extensive silicon validation, you know, both early in the process and late. And so I think it's sort of in this election year, there's a famous saying in Chicago, uh, vote early and vote often. Uh, so I think maybe the mantra here should be validate early and often. We want to validate early so that the early customers have confidence that the stuff is solid and then validate late so they can see the maturity and the production of PDK matches what they're expecting and that builds further confidence. And then, and then leveraging, which is the shuttles, and then leveraging the, uh, the metals from 20 nanometer is a key thing because it reduces one key source of problems as you scale. I think these guys said it all about the question. What I would like to say as a final word is, as you guys saw, I think Chromebook has introduced uh, you know, fanless computing nowadays. And so I think Finn has the potential to be the new fan. You don't need a fan anymore, perhaps. So with that, I'll close. Oh, great. Well, I'd like you to join me in thanking my panel, Bruce, Suvi, Srinivas, and Joe. And thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. That was a fantastic thing. Uh,